fact that their sum is 1, total weight is 1, we take this as lambda. So, I will call lambda as the square. Then we define the weighted arithmetic mean, this is the definition, to be lambda 1 a 1 plus lambda 2. When we had equal weights, lambda 1 is half, lambda 2 is half, that was the classical arithmetic mean a plus a 2 by 2. And similarly, we define this the weighted geometric mean to be a 1 power lambda 1 times a 2 power lambda. Again, when you take lambda 1 equal to lambda 2, you get the standard geometric mean square root of a 1 a 2. So, this is a weighted geometric mean and weighted arithmetic mean. The question was is the weighted mean also the arithmetic geometric mean inequality hold. This was the question that we asked. Okay. So, now we will look at this question. Well, this is true if and only if let us first write what it means that is the left hand side, this is the right hand side lambda 1 a 1 plus lambda 2 a 2. Okay. Again I will write in bracket without loss of generality assume a 1 a 2 greater than 0, because if any one of them is 0 again it is obvious geometric mean is 0 and therefore in equality. So, in all these cases we are assuming this to be non-zero or and we are assuming so strictly. So, without loss of generality assume a 1 a 2 to be 0, then this is a real number, that is a real number. So, x is less than or equal to y, if and only if the log x is less than or equal to log y, because the log is also a monotone increasing function. So, this is true if and only if log a 1 lambda 1 a 2 lambda 2 is less than or equal to log lambda 1 a 1 plus lambda 2. So, now let us take the log. So, it is lambda 1 times log a 1 plus lambda 2 times log a 2 is less than or equal to log lambda 1 a 1 plus lambda 2. So, therefore, the weighted arithmetic geometry mean boils down to the logarithm I pointed out in the beginning of yesterday when we started discussing inequality. So, therefore, all I have to do is verify whether this is true, whether that is true. So, if, if we prove this inequality, then automatically the geometric arithmetic mean is proved. Now, so, it is obvious from the graph of uh, uh, the then we will prove an analysis. Uh, also, I will carefully show you an analytic proof also, little bit clear. How does the gra graph of logarithm look like? It starts off at 0 at minus infinity and goes like that. Okay. Now, if you take any two points, just to show it very clearly, we will draw uh, uh, yes, any two points, real numbers a 1 and a 2 without loss of generality. If a 1 is equal to a 2, nothing to prove. Again, without loss of generality, a 1 is different from a 2 and both are greater than 0. So, suppose a 1 is here and a 2 is there, then this is log a 1, this height, this is log a 1 and that height on the y scale is log a 2. Right? What the this point is simply a point somewhere in between. That is a when lambda 1 a 1 plus lambda 2 a 2. Since a 1 is less than a 2, this will be less than lambda 1 a 2 a 1 
that is lambda 1 plus lambda 2 into a 1, which is a 1. So, this is less than, I am saying greater than a and less than a 2. So, this point here, if I call it as x, that lies here and therefore, log x is here and log x is actually a point there between a 1 and a 2, which is again a combination of this. So, that is exactly what we are trying to say that when the point lies here, the corresponding will lie there. Okay. So, let us keep this uh, straight. So, what we will do is uh, the following again without loss of generality a 1 not equal to a 2, because if a 1 equal to a 2 everything is obvious and one of them must be smaller. So, without loss of generality assume a 1 is smaller than a 2. Then we have a 1 here a 2 there. Now, take any point between a 1 and a 2 t. Okay. So, let t belong to a 1 a 2. Then let us define phi of t to be 1 over t. So, that is a function now defined for t moving from a 1 to a 2. So, this is a function phi of t is defined for t of a 1 and a 2. Now, take a point between these two that will be of the form lambda 1 t plus lambda 2 a 2. See this point lambda 1 t plus lambda 2 a 2 is greater than lambda 1 t and a 2 is greater than t lambda 1 plus lambda 2 is 1. So, this is greater than less than. So, it is a point that lies between t and a 2. Now, define a function psi of t to be 1 over lambda 1 t plus lambda 2 a 2. Now, I have to right. Now, t is smaller than this therefore, 1 over t will be greater than that. So, therefore, psi of t will be less than psi of t will be less than phi of t. t lies to the left. So, the inverse will lie, lie, will lie so, now integrate, there are all are continuous functions because a 1 is positive, everything is well defined. So, if I have two continuous functions, one curve lies always strictly above the other curve. So, the areas will be correspondingly maintained. So, the integral a 1 to a 2 psi t d t will be strictly less than a 1 to a 2 phi t d t because they are all continuous functions. Okay. Now, all you have to do is write it down explicitly that is integral d t by lambda 1 t plus lambda 2 a 2 a 1 to a 2 is less than a 1 to a 2 uh, d t by t. What is the integral of this? Put this as some u and do all the integration. It is 1 over lambda 1 log lambda 1 t plus lambda 2 a 2 bit for t between a 1 and a 2 is less than log t. So, it is log a 2 minus log a 1 or you take the lambda 1 to that side simply look at what you get lambda 1 a 2 plus lambda 2 a 2 minus log lambda 1 a 1 plus lambda 2 a 2. Take the lambda 1 that is positive. So, you can push it to the other side. Okay, so, now it is only a simplification lambda 1 into a 2 lambda 1 plus lambda 2 is 1. So, that log lambda a 2 
hog lambda 1 a 1 plus lambda 2 a 2 is less than lambda 1 log a 2 minus lambda 1 log Take this to that side, the rest to this side. There is 1 here and there is minus lambda and okay, let me first take log. Uh, uh, this one comes here as lambda 1 log a 1 and then the log a 2 term this and this combine give you 1 minus lambda 1 log a 2 and that goes to the other side lambda 2 a 2. Now, use the lambda 1 plus lambda 2 is 1. So, 1 minus lambda 1 is lambda 2. Strictly less than log lambda 1 a 1 plus lambda 2 and that is what star was. So, when does equal take place? When they were different, the areas are going to be strictly above and when they are equal, automatically equal. So, star holds and equality holds if and only if a 1 equal to a 2. Proof. So, therefore, we can now summarize and write our inequality g lambda is less than or equal to this equality holds if and only if a 1 equal to a 2. Okay. So, the weighted means also may train this inequality geometric is at most arithmetic and the geometric will match the arithmetic mean only when the two numbers are the same. We okay. will come back to means a little later, more means, okay. but let us now use these two simple uh, means to get some standard inequalities which are useful in analysis. So, we will now look at some applications. Of these, in, of these arithmetic geometric mean inequalities. Okay, first, we will draw, uh, uh, apply the standard arithmetic mean geometric mean that is without the weights. So, this is uh, 2, this is 3. So, first let us apply 2 the standard arithmetic mean geometric mean. Okay. So, I will carry on uh, uh, in, in simple steps before we reach there. Okay. Suppose, I have a vector with n components okay, and a vector y with n components such that they are all real and greater than or equal to c. Okay. They are all real and non negative. So, I am looking at say suppose you are in two dimensions, one, two of them are there, I am looking at vectors which are in the first quadrant okay. and if you are in three, you are looking at the first octant okay. so, x i, y i, z i, all three components are positive, not negative. Okay. Now, what I am going to do is, let me define alpha i to be x i squared and beta i to be y i squared. Still positive, no problem, everything is positive. Now, alpha i and beta i are positive, so I will up take a 1 as alpha i, a 2 as beta i and apply the a. So, by 2 with a 1 equal to alpha i, a 2 as equal to beta i, what do we get? The geometric mean is less than or equal to the arithmetic mean, but what is the geometric square root of alpha i must be less than or equal to alpha i by 2 plus beta i by 
but alpha i is x square, s i square, beta i is y square. So, this is x i y i, this is less than or equal to x i square by 2 plus y i square by 2. Okay. So, it is just apply the arithmetic geometry very clever of a 1 and a. The arithmetic mean itself is the clever choice of applying x and applying 0 less than or equal to x square. The fundamental inequality is 0 less than or equal to x square. Now, for every component we can do that i equal to 1 to n. Okay. This is true for 1 less than or equal to i less than or equal to n. Let us add all these inequalities. So, we get adding all this get summation x i y i i equal to 1 to n is less than or equal to i equal to 1 to n x square by 2 plus summation i equal to 1 to n y i square by two. Now, let us assume that the vector is unit length in our normal sense x 1 square plus x 2 square plus x n square is 1 and y 1 square plus y 2 square plus y n square. So, suppose for that that summation i equal to 1 to n x i square summation i equal to 1 to n y i square are both 1. Then what do we get? Summation i equal to 1 to n x i y i is less than or equal half plus half that is 1. Right. Okay. So, shall we write it here now uh, number 4 x is equal to x 1 x 2 x n y equal to y 1 y 2 y n x i y i greater than or equal to 0, summation i equal to 1 to n x i square equal to 1 equal to summation i equal to 1 to n y i square. All these imply summation i equal to 1 to n x i y i is less than or equal to 1. When does equality take place? right in the first step we must have equality and there arithmetic geometric mean equality means alpha i must be equal to beta i. This must happen for every i, x i square must be equal to y i square for every i, they are all non negative. Therefore, x i must be equal to y i for all i that means x and y must be the same vectors. So, equality holds depend only if x is equal to So, that is our first inequality. So, we will we'll push ourselves, we have now put lot of restrictions on the components, non-negative and they must have length 1. Now, I will lift the, we will try to lift the condition that the length must be 1 and subsequently lift the condition that they must be non-negative by everything reducing again and again back to this case. So, now, we look at, we remove, we have only this, okay. we may not have summation i equal to 1 to n x i square equal to 1 to n summation i equal to 1 to n x i So, therefore, I must somehow bring it to this case. So, whenever you have a vector whose length is not 1, you bring it down to a vector of length 1 by dividing it by the length. But if in order to divide by the length, I must make sure that I am not dividing by 0. So, I must assume that the vectors 
afterwards we will take the case when one of the vectors is 0. So, without la so suppose x y are non zero vectors. So, now what I am doing is I am taking positive vector now I am really in the first quadrant or the first octant ok. Previously in the first what is that? The unit cube or surface of the unit cube in the first quadrant or the first octant, but now I am allowed to wander around in the first octant and the first quadrant. Suppose x y are non zero vectors, then let u be equal to u 1, u 2, u n, v be equal to v 1, v 2, v n, u equal to u i equal to x i by square root of summation i equal to 1 to n x i square v i equal to y i by summation i equal to 1 to n y i square square root. Okay. So, I have divided the vectors by their length. So, now what can I say about u and v? They satisfy all the conditions for 4, their components are non-negative, they have length 1. So, I can apply 4 with u for the u v vector. So, apply 4 to u v vector. What do we get? Summation u i v i i equal to 1 to n is less than or equal to 1. Right. Now, u i is x i and v i is y i, I will take the denominator to the other side. Okay. See, when I write like this, it is now obvious that if one of the vectors is a 0 vector, this fellow is 0 and that fellow is also 0. So, no problem equals ok. Now, the vector is the 0 vector equality. So, we condition was only for this manipulation, but once you reach this step, it is valid even for the one of the vectors is the 0 vector ok. Now, that is the generalization of the previous fellow. Now, where does the equality take place? In the if it has to take place here, that is the u v case, that means u i must be equal to v i. u i equal to v i means x i must be equal to this number divided by the this number into y i, which is every component of x is the component of y, which means they are linearly dependent, and that is the case even if one of them is 0. So, equality depend only if x u i equal to v i for every i that is x i equal to some k times y i for every i where k is the y i. That is a number now all the numbers have been added up that number depends that is a constant now it does not depend on i. Okay. So, therefore, x y linearly defined. Okay. So, now we have got the next stage of this game that we will call as phi. So, what do we have now? x equal to x 1, x 2, x 10, y equal to y 1, y 2, y n uh, all are n component vectors x i y i greater than or equal to 0 implies summation i equal to 1 to n x i y i is less than or equal to summation i equal to 1 to n x i square square root to summation i equal to 1 to n square. Now, this becomes a special case of that with this length being equal to 1. Okay. All right. So, now we have moved to from here we put one condition. Now, we are going to remove the non-negativity condition. We want to remove the non-negative condition and get some kind of inequality for all vectors. Okay. That is our next stage. So,
So, what we do is take a vector x 1 x 2 x n y equal to y 1 y 2 y n and r n. I am not putting any more conditions non negative thing like that. Okay. So, when we wanted to prove this we reduced it to this case. Now, when you want to prove this we reduce it to this case. So, here we converted the vector to a unit vector. Now, we want to convert it to a vector which is negative because the moment you have none 4 can be like 4 okay. So, let u be the vector where u i is mod x i v i is mod y i. you see therefore, I am not worried, I have made everything non negative. So, u i greater than or equal to 0, v i greater than or equal to 0, therefore, can apply phi to u v vector. So, what you get? So, in place of x and y, you must write u and v summation i equal to 1 to n u i v i is less than or equal to summation i equal to 1 to n mod u i square square root of summation i equal to 1 to n mod v i square. But no mod is needed yes. Well, even if I put this not a sin okay. mod u i is the same as mod u i squared and v i mod u i squared and u i squared u i is real so it does not matter. Okay. So, now let us substitute that is summation i equal to 1 to n uh, what is it uh, u i is what mod x i and the other one is so mod x i into mod y i is mod x i y i that is less than or equal to square root of summation i equal to 1 to n mod x i square into square root of i equal to 1 to n mod y i square. Okay. Now, I am going to do the next thing. look at the mod outside summation i equal to 1 to n mod x i y i is less than or equal to modulus of a sum is less than or equal to sum of the modulus and that is less than or equal to this. So, what did I get? So, I get summation i equal to 1 to n i y i is less than or equal to summation mod x i square square root the square root of mod x i. When does How many places we need to have equality for this to happen? First of all, the equality must happen here, the equality must happen there. When does the equality happen here? That is our fourth case, that is the u vector and the v vector must be multiples of each other. That only says mod x i is alpha times mod y i. Sometimes it may be plus, sometimes it may be minus. So, we have to still not sure whether x and y are linearly depend, but then what does when does equality holds here? But if you want this 
equality both should be in the same direction not that direction so each must be a positive multiple of the other okay so here each must be the possible multiple of the other case the moduli is a possible multiple of the other combine the two you will get they will be linearly dependent so therefore we have our this is the fundamental <coughs> fundamental inequality which is i will first write implies call it as 6 this is one of our first fundamental summation moduli i equal to 1 to n x i y i is less than or equal to summation i equal to 1 to n mod x i squared square root square root summation i equal to 1 to n mod y i squared equality you find only x y linearly dependent and this is what is known as the cauchy schwarz and this is a simple consequence of arithmetic geometric mean you just go on using arithmetic geometric you will get this okay. so this is the cauchy schwarz inequality one of the cauchy schwarz we will generalize this later and that is the rational name for that is bunyakovsky's inequality more popularly known as schwarz inequality sometimes cauchy inequality sometimes cauchy schwarz inequality sometimes cauchy bunyakovsky schwarz inequality yeah any question so we have applied the arithmetic geometric mean to get one of the standard inequalities in which is probably used empty number of times in analysis is one of the most fundamental inequalities okay we will see in part to further extensions of this which is the broad uh, cauchy schwarz repeatedly used we will see more and more generalizations of this as we go along <coughs> okay now what happens if these are complex inequality the this inequality holds still and again equality holds if and only if all the complex numbers are positive multiples of one direction right so this holds from here everything is real so we can apply so the result is true even for complex so r so there is no problem about the is also whenever you have a real or complex n component vectors we have this inequality okay. this is the generalization of the two dimensional vector we have that x dot y is equal to the length of x into the length of y into cos theta and see the modulus of cos theta is less than 1 modulus of x dot y is less than or equal to the length of x into the length of y that generalization is this inequality. okay now let's take a bit of the out of the generalized arithmetic geometric mean inequality the weighted arithmetic geometry what do we get out of that okay so we will get generalization of a more general version of the cauchy inequality we will call it it is called the holders inequality okay now you will see that we will follow the same procedure i will just indicate this side this step and once we go to the step where we are the lengths are one the remaining then go to the next case where the length is made one and then go to the next case where everything is made positive and the same order of will give you the remaining results okay so the crucial step is to prove for unit uh, vectors unit vectors with positive coefficient so once again let us take x equal to x1 x2 xn y equal to y1 y2 yn they are all real x i y i greater than or equal to 0 and okay i will i will not write anything else now 
okay they go there there is a feedback now let us take a weight now we are going to take a weighted where lambda 1 lambda 2 greater than 0 and lambda 1 plus lambda 2 is 1. So, I am going to apply the uh, weighted arithmetic geometric mean repeatedly that is the idea. So, now lambda 1 is is less than 1 because the total sum is 1. So, lambda 1 is less than 1 I will call p as 1 by lambda 1 q as right lambda 2 okay. and then p is greater than 1, q is greater than 1, 1 by p plus 1 by q equal to 1. Okay. So, when two real numbers p and q are greater than 1 and if the reciprocals add up to 1, they are called conjugate to each other. Okay. So, p and q are said to be conjugate to each other. Now, I am going to define the numbers, let us see. I am going to define alpha i to be x i to the power of 1 by lambda 1, y i to the power of 1 by lambda 2, which is x i to the power of p, y i to the power of to the power of p, y to the power of q. Then apply 3 is the weighted arithmetic geometric mean. What do we have? G lambda i. Uh, Let us take A to be alpha i, A 1 to be alpha i and B A 2 to be uh, beta i and apply geometry. So, they have a g lambda a is less than or equal to g lambda a. Okay. But now, let us write out what is g lambda a. g lambda a is a 1 power lambda 1, a 2 power lambda 2 less than or equal to lambda 1 a 1 plus lambda 2 the weighted arithmetic mean and the weighted geometric what is this? A 1 is alpha i power lambda 1 beta i to the power of lambda 2 less than or equal to alpha i to the power of what was A 1? Uh, A 1 was alpha i plus Okay. What is alpha i to the power of lambda 1? X i. Beta i to the power of lambda 2? Y i. Less than or equal to lambda 1 x i power p plus lambda 2 q. Y power that okay. Now, this is true for all i. So, add up all of them. What do I get? Summation i equal to 1 to n x i y i is less than or equal to lambda 1 summation x i power p i equal to 1 to n plus lambda 2 i equal to 1 to n y i power q. Okay. So, just like previously we assumed that the sums were 1, I am going to assume that this sum is 1 and that sum is 1. So, assume 
summation i equal to 1 to n x i power p is 1 is equal to summation i equal to 1 to 1 y i power q. Then what happens to the right side? Just lambda 1 plus lambda 2, but lambda 1 plus lambda 2 is 1 and therefore, we get summation x i y i. When will equality happen? Again go back x i will be allowed to be equal to be y i. Okay. So, we have the seventh inequality equal to this 1 over p q greater than 1, 1 over p plus 1 over q equal to 1 and then summation x i power p equal to 1, summation <coughs> x i y i to the power of q is also equal to 1. So, all these conditions imply summation i equal to 1 to n x i y i and equality okay what will you do next if this is not one and if this is not make the excess as one by dividing this by to the power of over p and y over q Therefore, that becomes 1. So, next case is x equal to x 1, x 2, x n, y equal to y 1, y 2, y n, p q greater than 1, 1 over p plus 1 over q equal to 1, that implies summation x i y i equal to 1 to n, less than or equal to. Previously, the denominator went to the other side and gave us this product. Now, what did it do? Other side, by root I will get to the power 1 over p. So, that will become summation i equal to 1 to n x i power p to the power of 1 over p, summation i equal to 1 to n y i to the power of q 1 over q. Of course, I have forgotten that uh, fact that y i greater than or equal to 0. Okay. Now, what is the next step to remove the non-negativity? So, that we can now state the result for all vectors. How do you remove the non-negativity? Look at the moduli. Okay. So, as in step 5 to 6, we get this is the next important inequality called Holder's inequality, which says that x y belongs to again we can have r n and then r n to c n also because the modulus things work r n r c n implies and 1 p q greater than 1, 1 over p plus 1 over q equal to 1 implies summation x i y i i equal to 1 p n modulus is less than or equal to summation i equal to 1 p n x i to the power not x i to the power of p to the power of 1 over p into summation i equal to 1 p n mod y i to the equality equivalent only is x y this is called the holder inequality. So, if you put p equal to q equal to 2 you get the Cauchy Schwarz inequality that is lambda 1 equal to lambda 2 equal to half which is the same thing as saying p equal to q equal to 2 is the case. So, this is only a special case of the holder inequality with p equal to q these are two important inequalities, namely the Cauchy Schwartz and the Holder's inequality. Next, I will prove one more inequality 
which is called the Minkowski's inequality. Okay, that is the crucial inequality for us. So that these inequality a very crucial role in the analysis of functionals on finite dimensional spaces. Okay, then we will lift ourselves to the case where we will allow infinite number of components and get Cauchy Schwartz, get Holder's inequality and get Minkowski's inequality when we have infinite component vectors and this will play a crucial role while analyzing functionals on infinite dimensional spaces. Okay. So, next, uh, so I will erase all this because now I have no more space to save the, all the inequality. So, I will go back to the first page and then start from here. And this is called the Minkowski inequality. Okay. So, again I am going to look at x equal to x 1, x n, y equal to y 1, y 2, y n all are in R n take any two vectors n component, the components can be complex. Now, mod x i, okay, once again let us take p to be greater than 1, okay. there will be a corresponding index to that will not appear, you will use it. Okay. So, let us take p is greater than 1 and q the corresponding conjugate index. What does that mean? 1 over p plus 1 over q is equal to 1, q is greater than 1 and 1 over p equal to plus 1 over q equal to 1. We will bring it in some of. Now, look at first look at this mod x i plus y i. and I will take the power t. Okay. You will see what we are trying to do shortly. This I will write as mod x i plus y i to the power of p minus 1 into mod x i plus y i. Nothing surprising. I just took one term out and remaining power because p is greater than 1. So, there is at least one there, I pulled it out and the remaining powers I kept there. So, mod x i plus y i to the power of p minus 1 into this, but this is less than or equal to mod x i plus mod y i. That is okay, right? There is no problem about that. Now, therefore, I will write it as mod x i plus y i to the power of p is less than or equal to mod x i into mod x i plus y i to the power of p minus 1 plus mod y i into mod x i plus y i to the power of p minus 1. Okay. So, I can add all of them. Okay, I added all the inequalities from i equal to 1 to n. Look at the holder's inequality. If all are positive, non-negative, I do not have to put the modulus here. Okay. So, suppose I had non-negative, <coughs> the holder's holds for the modulus. Now, take mod x i to be the first factor 
and this as the second factor. So, let alpha i be equal to mod x i, beta i to be equal to mod x i plus y i plus x to the power of p minus. So, therefore, by holder summation alpha i beta i, I do not put modulus because alpha i and beta i are non negative. Okay, that less than or equal to summation i equal to 1 to n, what does the Olds inequality say? Alpha i to the power of p to the power of 1 over p. So, it is alpha i to the power of p to the power of 1 over p times beta i to the power of q to the power of 1 over q. Now, let us substitute for alpha i in beta i. So, therefore, summation i equal to 1 to n mod x i into mod x i plus y i to the power of p minus 1 is less than or equal to summation i equal to 1 to n alpha i is mod x i to the power of 1 over p and what is beta i mod x i plus y i to the power of q to the power of I am sorry to the power of p minus 1 into q to the power of 1 correct. Now, what is that? That is equal to summation i equal to 1 to n mod x i to the power of p to the power of 1 over p into summation i equal to 1 to n mod x i plus y i is p minus 1 into q. Look here p plus q equal to p q, right. So, q is equal to p q minus p equal to p minus 1 into q. So, p minus 1 into q is just is it uh, is it equal to p to the power of p to the power of so p minus 1 into q is equal to p no is it equal to q or p okay i will keep the p here and take the q there then it is p minus 1 into q is equal to p ah, it's very simple manipulation okay. right so we have got this similarly if i replace the xi by yi i will get this term to be yi to the power of p similarly summation mod y i to the power of times mod x i plus y i to the power of p minus 1 is less than or equal to summation i equal to 1 to n mod y i to the power of p to the power of 1 over p times the same term because it is the same term for both. So, what do I get from these two? In the right hand side this term is smaller than that and this term is smaller than this and therefore, we get summation i equal to 1 to n mod x i plus y i to the power of p is left hand side is less than or equal to the sum of these two terms. In these two terms, this it out summation i equal to 1 to n mod x i plus y i to the power of p to the power of 1 over q into summation i equal to 1 to n mod x i to the power of p to the power of 1 over p plus summation i equal to 1 to n mod y i to the power of q to the power of 1 to the power of p. we are almost done. This term and this term, right? so we will bring this fellow to this side, what do I get? 
summation i equal to 1 to n mod x i plus y i to the power of p to the power 1 power here and a minus 1 over q will come this side. So, what is 1 minus 1 over q is precisely 1 by p. And this is what is known as Minkowski. All these cases equality will hold, you would only be linearly dependent, you will trace back all the places equality and you will get that. So, that is what is known as the Minkowski inequality. So, now I lost the number, so this is called Minkowski. Which means x y belong to R n or C n, P q greater than 1, 1 over P plus uh, and this P greater than 1 is enough for me. I will write first P greater than 1, summation i equal to 1 to n implies mod x i plus y i to the power of P to the power of 1 over P is less than or equal to plus summation i equal to 1 to n mod y i to the power of q to the power of 1 over q. Equality depend only f x y linearly depends. When p equal to 1, this is obvious. See, when p equal to 1, what happens? Mod x i plus y i is certainly less than or equal to mod x i plus mod y i add them p equal to 1, this is obvious. So, therefore, I can write the p greater than or equal to 1, this is true. Okay. Let us call the Minkowski's inequality. So, these are three uh, fundamental uh, inequality, the Cauchy Schwartz, the Holder's inequality and the Minkowski's inequalities and they are all consequences of simple arithmetic geometric mean, older uh, the Cauchy Schwartz is standard arithmetic geometric mean, older is a weighted arithmetic geometric mean consequence and Minkowski is consequence. So, at the root of the a m and below that is the root x squared is greater than or equal to 0 and equal to 0 f 1 over x equal to 0. It will not be true the inequality need not be true. Because remember, I have used the fact the arithmetic geometry. There I have used certain things about the logarithmic function and the function 1 over t. Okay. Now, subsequently this all means certain amount of terminologies like concavity or convexity. That power p less than 1 <coughs> does not give that particular property and therefore, this whole thing collapses. So, we need huh? what do you mean? No, 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 you can manipulate because suppose the components are 0, okay, so, so many components are 0, then it is going to happen. Okay. So, that is the that is the problem. So, in p greater than p less than 1 all kinds of funny things can happen. So, the best thing is to avoid them. Okay, and uh, for our purposes, these are the things. Uh, some of the standard examples. Okay, so what this, what this will give, what this will give us is a number of examples of metric spaces, normally spaces, also Hilbert spaces, which are the, and more importantly, this will give us the structure of functionals in these spaces. Okay. So, now we have consolidated the fact. So, look at this uh, consolidated the fact that we talk about the Schwartz type inequality, Holder type inequality, Minkowski type inequality 
for vectors with finite number of components. Now, we will push our luck and see whether we can get something similar to this for infinite component vectors. That is, I remember there was a conference several years ago on functional analysis in the Delhi University. So, the vice chancellor at that time was one professor Udit Narayan Singh, who was a functional analyst. So, he organized the conference. At the end of the conference, the last day afternoon, he asked us whether we can have a general discussion on the curriculum that we should have for functional analysis courses in our universities. And it was everybody welcomed the idea and the afternoon session started and one of a very senior professors uh, was asked to very good analyst was asked to chair the session. And uh, he started the session with the chairman's remark. The first remark he made was non trivial functional analysis starts when linear operator theory ends and non linear operator starts. More importantly, when bounded operators end and unbounded operators start. And most of the fellows who presented the paper in the conference were those who worked on bounded linear operators. So, more or less he dismissed all of them saying <laughs> that you are not fit to talk about functional analysis. Now, I taking the cue from him, I will say non trivial beginning of functional analysis starts with infinite dimensional spaces. So, therefore, these inequalities we must at least generalize to move towards the simple vectors with infinite number of components. So, to that end we have to go to this idea of extending these inequalities for infinite component vectors. So, towards this end let us first start with sequences that is a sequence of components are there and these are all vectors in R n or C n. Say that again, I am sorry not R n and C. I will not use any symbols ok, x j y j I will use symbols later or Okay. Now, let us look at this. Suppose, we want to get an inequality similar to Minkowitz. Let us go backwards. Just now, we saw Minkowitz's inequality. How should it look like? So, how should it look? Okay. So, so something like this. What was the old case that we had? P q greater than 1 or P greater than 1 summation i equal to 1 to n mod x i plus y i to the power of P less than or equal to summation i equal to 1 to, sorry, to the power of 1 over P mod x i to the power of P to the power of 1 over P plus summation i equal to 1 to n mod y i to the power of p to the power of 1 over p. This is what we had for finite case. So, now what we would expect is we want something like this, right. We would like to have something like that. 
that is a huge problem. Huh? Instead of which one? No, yeah, that in that is what we symbolically we write as a series. Okay, right. Now look at that right hand side. If any one of these sums is infinite, the right hand side is infinite. There is nothing great about it. Okay, but it may happen that this and this are finite. We don't know whether that is going to be finite or infinite. So we have to worry if one of them is infinite, one of the sums is infinite. There is really nothing to prove. The right hand side is infinite, less than infinite. not a big deal. So the non-trivial one we have to worry about is when both of them are finite. So if either summation i equal to 1 to infinity mod x i to the power of p or summation i equal to 1 to infinity mod y i to the power of p is, is infinity, then nothing to prove. So, we have to look at x y such that for both this two are finite for both that must be finite and then see what we get this is trivial one of them turns out to be infinite so the non trivial question that we should look at is if x and y or two sequences of real or complex numbers such that that sum and this sum are finite, then does such an inequality hold? Okay, that is the question. So, now let us look at how we will do it. Now, you see when this and this are finite, that means the right hand side is already finite. Therefore, we must assume, assure first of all that finite. Okay. Now, to assure that the left hand side is finite, it is enough if without the power 1 over p I say it is finite. If this is finite, to the power of 1 over p is also finite. So, to say that this is finite, I must say that series converges. So, I want to assure that the series mod x i plus y i to the power of p converges. So, therefore, we should know what is meant by saying a series is convergent. When does the series converge? When the sequence of converges. In this case, sums go on increasing or at least non decreasing because every term is non negative. So, I have got some sum, I am going to add one more term which is non negative. So, the partial sums are non decreasing, a non decreasing sequence will converge if there is a upper bound. So, if we will not be show that the sequence of partial sums are bounded, what is meant by partial sum? Summation i equal to 1 to n. Suppose I show there is a number k such that summation i equal to 1 to n, this is finite, I am finished. Okay. So, if in this case, RHS is less than infinity, this fellow. Okay. Let me call it as RHS of 1. RHS of 1 is finite. We want to make sure first that LHS is finite. Okay. That is for this, it is enough if we show summation i equal to 1 to infinity mod x i plus y i to the power of p is less than infinity. Okay. For this, 
since terms are all non negative, it is enough if we show there exists a constant k independent of n, okay, such that that summation i equal to 1 to n mod x i plus y i to the power of p for every okay? that is the idea. If you show that the partial sums are all bounded, then the series of non negative terms is forced to be converging. You see how cleverly we brought down the problem to looking at a sum which is only of terms. You see, we, we have more or less brought problem to a finite case. Okay. Now, therefore, let us look at this. So, now if you look at summation i equal to 1 to n mod x i plus y i to the power of p to the power of 1 over p, since there are only now, I can apply old Minkowski that is less than or equal to summation i equal to 1 to n mod x i to the power of 1 over p plus summation i equal to 1 to n mod y i to the power of p to the power of 1 over p by Minkowski. Okay. This is true for for every n, whatever finite n we choose, we can apply Minkowski. But now, what can I say about the right hand side? Any finite sum is less than the corresponding infinite sum. Let us call this as x and this as y. x is given to be finite and y is given to be finite. So, x plus y is what I call as k. So, therefore, summation i equal to 1 to n mod x i plus y i to the power of p to the power of 1 over p is less than or equal to x plus y and we are done. And not only that, we can now let n go to infinity and what do we get? What we are looking for? Let n go to infinity, you get this equation. Partial sums are bounded, and therefore the least upper bound must be smaller, smaller than or equal to any bound. And so, okay, so therefore, let n go to infinity. The general Minkowski inequality. So, the general Minkowski inequality will state now. is p greater than 1 summation x i to the power of p i equal to 1 to infinity is less than infinity summation i equal to 1 to infinity mod y i to the power of p is less than infinity. All this implies summation mod x i plus y i to the power of p to the power of 1 over p is less than summation i equal to 1 to infinity mod x i to the P, P plus summation mod y i P, P. Now, with that notation, we can simply say x plus y. This is for the vector x plus y, this is for the vector x, this is for the vector y. Okay, for the vector x, I wrote mod x i to the power of P to the power of 1 over P for the vector y I wrote mod y i and for the vector x plus y I will have to write x i plus y i. This is roughly the idea. Okay. So, that is the general Minkowski schema. One step further up now, we have got into infinite component vectors. Whenever x and y are such that their pth power add up to finite, the sum will also the pth power will add up to finite. 
of the sum will be less than or equal to p power individual sum. Okay. When p equal to 1, that is the obvious inequality. Okay. If summation x i is finite, summation y i is finite, summation mod x i plus y i is also finite. So, therefore, the we can even write p greater than or equal to 1 or p equal to 1 case it is obvious. So, this is called the Minkowski. So, what what it says is if you take this sum as the measure of such a vector, what measure you call it a length measure or whatever it is, some kind of a quantification of the vector x and this is the corresponding quantification of the vector y. These quantifications are induced by a number p which is greater than 1. So, this is the p quantification of x, the p quantification of y, p quantification of x plus y will be less than or equal to the p quantification of x and the p. This is the normal modulus x plus y less than or equal to modulus x plus modulus y. Re modulus is one quantification. Okay. That is now general p quantification of vectors and even that language the p quantification of a sum is less than or equal to the individual p quantification. That is what Minkowski's inequality is. This will tell us, we will see some, some put them all together later and see that such vectors form a vector space. This makes us not only they form a vector space, and in that vector space, this acts as a quantification or a notion of length. That is what is known as normed linear space. So, we will look at those formal definitions later. That is why we need all these inequalities. Similarly, at least uh, may, may not, uh, I will not have. Similarly, let us look at holder. So, in the infinite case, what are the finite case holder? That is less than or equal to summation i equal to 1 to n. i equal to 1 to n mod y i to the power of q to the power of 1 over q, where this p and q were conjugate, 1 over p plus 1 over q must be. Now, therefore, what we want is, if I now take the infinite number of components, is this true? That is what in infinite dimensional space. Once again, if one of them is infinite, it is trivial. If one of those sums is infinite, the right hand side is already infinity and everybody is going to be smaller than him, no problem. So, the non trivial case is when both of them are finite. So, non trivial question is these two are finite. Then is it what is the procedure? First, we must take left hand side to be finite. For that, we must show we can't say that now this is a non negative sum. So, what do we do first? First, you put this and then that is bounded above, and one that is this is bounded above, this, that series converges, this absolute convergence we have. Once we have absolute convergence, anything will converge, and therefore the sum of any such sum will be. So similar thing is called the. Uh, this is called the. It is true, and that is we'll uh, quickly see it next time. And that's called the Holder's inequality for the infinite case. And in the special case, p equal to q equal to two, we get the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Okay. So that is the standard length summation mod x i squared i equal to one to so, the corresponding, so p equal to q equal to 2 will give us the uh, Cauchy Schwartz. So, 
so therefore starting from this generic inequality x squared greater than or equal to 0 if and only and equal to 0 if and only if x equal to 0 we get a series of inequalities lifted step by step arithmetic geometric mean weighted arithmetic geometric mean cauchy schwarz weighted cauchy schwarz with solder and then minkowski then go to infinite components we have got a whole list of fundamental and inequality we can get uh, uh, see for example what are all these they are all averages they everything started from average arithmetic average is one geometric average is one bit so the geometric average and the arithmetic average are compared we got inequalities we can now generate a number of averages from this idea. So, there is a whole family of averages, it is not just geometric, there is not just arithmetic. We can generate a whole family of averages and we can talk about the various. It says is jocularly that in every problem some average will give a good result. So, if arithmetic average is bad, try geometric average. See, suppose we say average score is 35, it is a good perf performance, but if you take arithmetic average, it may come out as 34.7. So, it will reflect as a bad performance, but therefore, you take geometric average, that is going to be smaller. And if that is not good, take some other average, which will make smaller. Okay. So, there are a huge number of averages. So, when somebody says on an average, it is good we do not know what he is talking about, unless he tells me what is the average in which it is good. So, therefore, this word, the word mean is very mean, okay, unless it is explicitly told what it is, we do not know what it means. Okay. So, we have to be very, very uh, careful. All right. So, we will now possibly, I will in the next class, I will uh, uh, I will assume this holder and Cauchy Schwarz because the arguments are the same. Uh, so, therefore, we have all these inequalities, and uh, I will just move indicate okay, the next step. See, in all these cases, what we have done is we have 1, 2, 3 n components, then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 n, etcetera, etcetera, infinite number of components. What if we have a continuum of components? We get to the notion of functions. See, what all, after all, okay, one minute. You can take the vector one, x one, x two, etc. We can think of this as a function from the set one, two, and any sequence, etc. To the real R. And the value at 1 is called the first component, the value at 2 is called the second is called the So, instead of this, suppose I have an interval i on the real line and I look at functions, real or complex valued functions, and now can I ask something like Minkowski? What does the Minkowski say? If I have two such functions, what that what should that be replaced with? Integral over i of mod x t to the power of p is finite and integral over i mod y t to the power of q is finite or that is also finite. I will just look at Minkowski. Then the question is whether integral over i mod x t plus y t to the power of p to the power of 1 over p is less than or equal to uh, i mod x t to the power of p d t to the power of 1 over p plus the y term. Okay. Of course, the problem comes with what, what integral are you are talking about. So, all this uh, business of which integral let us say suppose for the time being f and g were continuous function, then the normal Riemann integration we can do and we can ask this question. Okay. Now, the answer turns out same. Previously, what did you do? 
we wrote the arithmetic geometric mean we added all of them now we have the arithmetic geometric mean integrate both sides you get the uh, standard inequalities for at least these function for which function makes sense. next okay so we will now get more holders inequality minkowski's inequality and cauchy-schwarz inequality for functions also so we get we will get vector spaces etc etc which are infinite dimensional which are function spaces so we'll get a number of uh, uh, examples that will be our rest to work with these are all class these are all classical examples of metric spaces nonlinear spaces barnard spaces hilbert spaces one we'll use them to get the right type of space so we must have at least a whole collection of uh, examples for us to understand our uh, abstract theory of functionals okay um, okay so next class what i will do is i will spend short time on these things then to metric space think of 